Hello everybody, Matt Williamson here from Pop Goes the 60s. I done a video earlier this year on a book review, and I, the book was The Beatles and the Historians, an analysis of the writings about the Fab Four by Aaron Weber. And I have a special treat for you to, today if you really like that book. Aaron joins us today. Aaron, thank you for being here. It's great to be here. Thank you for asking me. I loved your book. And the reason I loved it is because as I got deeper into Beatles history, uh, what I found was that your book essentially organized all the writings on the Beatles into four separate categories or four separate narratives. And once I understood those narratives, their history really made a lot of sense to me. So I really was excited. Uh, your, your book was one of the better Beatle, book, Beatle books I've ever read. So I was really um, excited to do a video about it, which is why I did that video originally. One of the things that people on my channel have come to to understand and come to like is this tackling of the Beatles history. And I just wanted to start this by asking you why you started to apply historiography to the Beatles. And maybe we should talk about what historiography is uh, just in general. Well, historiography is something that I wasn't familiar with until I took an actual class on it. And as a history major in college, I was required to take historical methods and historiography. And frankly, it was a class I did not want to take, mm -hmm. but it was required if you wanted to graduate with that major. So when you have no choice, you have to do it anyway. But I loved the class and had the same reaction to it that you did, you said upon reading my book, in that you take it, or at least I took it when I was a junior in college. So at that point in time, I'd studied the American Civil War or the American Revolution. I was mm. an American history major. Okay. And also Balkan history, the history of various subjects, particularly World War I, because it's something any modern historian has to deal with. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until I took historiography and was taught about how our versions of history change, how narratives change, why they change mm -hmm. because of chronology, because of sourcing, because of politics, that the framework really fell into place of, OK, this is why we have this version of who started World War I in the 1920s. And that's why it changes in the 1930s. And this is why we have a different version post-World War II. And this is why we have a different version in the 1960s. So mm -hmm. it provides this structure and this framework, really like a frame for the puzzle piece, I guess would be a good way to put it, okay. that if you don't have the historiography, you can read hundreds of books on a subject, but you're still lacking some essential information. Okay. Can you give us an example of just like a World War I example? I mean, I know the, the perspective of Americans was much different than Europeans just in general because of who started the war, where it happened. Can you just give us an example of how history can be skewed? Well, I think perspective is a good way to put it because one of the areas of World War I and we have this acknowledged by the initial wave of historians following the war is that it was a very top-down perspective. So you had histories written by governments or by generals or by mm. politicians or diplomats or monarchs, but what you did not have was the perspective of the average soldier in the trenches. And this is acknowledged by that first wave of historians and their justification is well, the average soldier in the trenches has such a narrow view mm -hmm. that they can't really add much mm -hmm. to the historiography of World War I, which of course we know is incorrect mm -hmm. because absolutely they have an incredibly valuable perspective to add to our understanding of World War I. And what you saw as time went on is that perspective began to be incorporated into World War I's historiography. So that's really one area that happens with the passage of time is it's not just that narratives change because politics change or because sources become available. It's that sources that were previously ignored become incorporated. Okay. And with the Beatles, we see the same thing happening now 50 plus years after their breakup we're finally getting a little bit of a clearer view of some of the actual events, because maybe some of those things you mentioned were ignored. Absolutely. 
And that's one of the wonderful things I loved when I really delved into Beatles historiography is how closely it follows patterns that I had observed in other historiographical subjects. Interesting. Well, let's dive into the four narratives that you you outlined, because I think they're very easy to understand. And uh, I think that once, and some people still cling to some things because they don't have the proper information or some other new information that has come forward that might debunk something. And every, there's always new information being added to these narratives, really, as mm-hmm. long as there's interest. And nobody's, it's not like we're going to stop writing about the Beatles. So can you give us just a kind of a run through of the four narratives? Absolutely. The first narrative that you get is what I refer to as the Fab Four narrative. I think in my rough draft, I also called it the A Hard Day's Night narrative. Mm -hmm. So it's the first version of the Beatles that the public sees, and it's the one they promote in their interviews. It's the one they promote in their press conferences, Mm -hmm. and it pushes the band's friendship, and it pushes considerable whitewashing of the band's actions, Mm -hmm. the band's story, particularly in relation to sex and drugs. Mm -hmm. And it also pushes the necessity and the equality of the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership. And the reason I refer to it as the A Hard Day's Night narrative is because you have promotion, certainly, of all of those three aspects in that movie. And for many millions of people, that movie was their first real visual introduction, extensive visual introduction Mm -hmm. to the band. And there are numerous writers who have declared that that helps concretize our impression of the band Mm -hmm. for decades. And it seems like as the Beatles career moved on, even to like 1966, the Beatles themselves were starting to chip away at that kind of clean image. But it seemed like people didn't want to accept that even then, even though it came from them, which is interesting. I think Pete Shotton has a great quote about that in John Lennon In My Life, where he talks about how the press and the fans had a particular version of the Beatles, and it tended to be the Hard Day's Night version of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And they did not want to assess evidence or incorporate evidence that contradicted Hmm. that initial version they were exposed to. Hmm. Interesting. So obviously, uh, the only biography written during that time was the Hunter Davies book. And how would you rate that? Uh, Maybe it's not the only one, but it's the the most famous one, I guess. Uh, Yeah, you also have Braun's work. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the title of it is. And that was published really 1963 1964 yes yeah, so love me do was that what it was called yes yes, yes that's what mm-hmm. it was okay. so to go back to the authorized biography sorry to interrupt what was your question uh just asking about the ones that were uh published during the fab four period where the beatles were still a band so uh, i brought up the hunter davies book and you mentioned the, the love me do book so what that means to how close is that to well, the whitewashing, I guess? Was that contributing to the whitewashing? To a lesser extent than some previous sources that you had mm. had, you do have some fairly negative material in the authorized biography. You have Davies' discussion of John and Cynthia's marriage, mm. which is not overwhelmingly positive. Mm. You do have... A rather bleak description regarding Brian Epstein's final months. Uh-huh. Now it's done with compassion and it's done with sympathy, mm. but it does explore many of the issues or some of the issues that Epstein was really struggling with towards the end of his life. Mm-hmm. And you do have an interesting comment from Ringo towards the end of the book where he's talking about Beatles fans and how sometimes I would have to reread the authorized biography and see exactly what it is he says but he makes a sort of comment of I think something to the effect of sometimes John fans and Paul fans don't get along very well 
It's an you interesting know, comment to be making in 1968, wow. given, of course, what happens later. Yes. I had, I, I've not actually read that book all the way through, so I've got to look into that one. That's really fascinating. Huh. There's also a very sad comment from Ringo where, I believe this is in the authorized biography, he says something to the effect of, if you put each beetle at the head of a line and then lined up their fans behind him, I think he says Paul would have the most, John would be next, George would be third, and he would be dead last. <laughs> oh, poor Ringo. Yeah. Well, you know, he. I guess uh, it's funny how young they were when they got together and how that brotherly, uh, what would you call it? The, uh, you know, like you have brothers and sisters older to younger and you have the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And you just can't escape that. And the four guys didn't really escape that in the Beatles, certainly Ringo and George. No. So, and we'll talk more about Ringo and George a little later because uh, in the history, the history of them it really marginalizes them quite a bit. It does. So, and I consider that one of the largest weaknesses of certain narratives in Beatles historiography. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the next one, which is, uh, John Lennon's uh, Lennon Remembers, the Jan Winner interview in Rolling Stone, which got things started. And John Lennon was clearly severely overcorrecting the Fab Four narrative, uh, I would say to a very big fault. Um, but that, it's interesting, that one seems to have been almost harder to get rid of than the Hard Day's Nights narrative, you know. And um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, the Lennon Remembers? Well. The Lennon Remembers narrative, as you discussed, is really a rejection of the Fab Four narrative, and it rejects the closeness among the band's members. It exposes some of the whitewashing, including mm -hmm. Epstein's homosexuality and some of the sexual escapades on tour. Mm -hmm. And it also rejects not only the necessity of the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership, John really denies in Lennon Remembers that it ever really existed. Now, John has a habit of contradicting himself, so he goes back and forth on that issue, mm -hmm. but he does reject all of those elements. And one of the other crucial areas with the Lennon Remembers narrative is that it's also the breakup era narrative, so that you have this added component of who is to blame for the breakup. Mm. And that plays a crucial role because in addition to the four Beatles, we have the addition of Linda Eastman, Yoko Ono, and Alan Klein. Mm -hmm. And those are some pretty polarizing individuals in Beatles historiography. I must, yeah, you're right about that. And there's plenty of blame to go around for the breakup. That, that's for sure. And it seems like the Lennon remembers, it seemed, to, well, that whole breakup period for a long time, Paul was blamed. And uh, he wasn't really let off the hook on that one for many years, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, that's just how the history told it at that time. And, and it's interesting because we have comments from Paul. I believe we have that 82 conversation with Hunter Davies, hmm. where Paul explicitly complains that he's blamed in the history books for breaking up the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So he did receive a considerable amount of blame if you look at Lennon remembers if mm. you look at apple to the core if you look at the trial testimony in the beatles trial in 71 then paul is identified as the primary if not the sole reason that the band is breaking up now a lot of that has to deal with our view or the then view of alan klein and mm. obviously that shifts really does a 180 from 1971 to the current day. Yeah, it's, um, he w Klein was incredibly polarizing and he was a, quite a good PR man himself. And Paul, you know, it's, it's funny because Paul was really the guy trying to keep the band together more than anybody. And he's the one that ends up getting blamed. And he had a couple major PR blunders. I don't know why people consider him a great PR guy. I think he's terrible in many cases, absolutely horrible but uh one of the things was his press release of his first solo album that didn't say that the Beatles were breaking up by the way but that's how the media reported it and that began part of the blame on Paul I guess 
Well, I do think there's a lot of justification for Paul as this great PR guy because he was the one who was most willing to do it in the band's heyday. Mm -hmm. And so when he's giving interviews in 65, 66, 67, he's the one who's most willing to do that. And we have discussion of that from people like Tony Barrow or Tony Bramwell, where if they need someone to do an interview and the interviewer does not want George or Ringo, then they will go to Paul because Paul acknowledges that that's part of the price of superstardom. Mm -hmm. It's really when you get to the breakup period and when you get to the arguments and the legal disagreements that Paul's PR savvy deserts him, because I think you have a different sort of approach really in that time Mm -hmm. period. It's not selling something that people already love. It's trying to use legalese to explain Mm -hmm. why the band that everyone loves is breaking up and why the other three are saying it's your fault and you're claiming it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. Well, we get in the next narrative that doesn't help Paul either, and that's the shout narrative. If you could give us a little background on that one. The shout narrative is absolutely heavily influenced first by the Lennon Remembers narrative. In a lot of ways, it's a continuation of the Lennon Remembers narrative because it adopts all of the major aspects of its predecessor. But there's also two elements that distinguish it. Number one, there's an emotional component to it because Shout, the book for which the narrative is named, is published in March 1981, only a few short months after John Lennon is murdered. But the other element here is that in our previous narratives, we've generally been dealing with primary sources. So we've been dealing with what the band themselves was saying in A Hard Day's Night or in the authorized biography or in the Lennon Remembers interview when we get to the Lennon Remembers narrative. Shouts the first narrative where control of the narrative switches from primary sources to secondary sources. Mm. And that actually adds a layer of credibility for some readers because it's not John saying this is Beatles history or Paul saying this is Beatles history. It's what you would hope would be an impartial author saying this is Beatles history. Hmm. But again, the shout narrative is heavily patterned off of and reliant on the Lennon Remembers narrative. And it depends heavily on new biographies that come out in this time period of the early to mid 80s, including Philip Norman Shout and Ray Coleman's Lennon. And the issue with these works is that they have considerable methodological weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Can you give us what some of those are? I mean, in terms, I know where you're going with that. And let's just talk about citations for, for starters, I guess is a big one, because a lot of these authors, I'm now used to seeing citations within the text. That's right. a great help as opposed to trying to find it in the back of a book. And sometimes they can deceive you by not having anything in the back of the book. So that means, well, is this a true citation or not? It's incredibly frustrating to me because I started reading Beatles books as a fan and I really just read whatever my library system had available and I would read quotes, but I would not know the year that that quotation was given. I would not know the interview. I would look in the back of the book for a bibliography and I would not see primary sources. I would not see secondary sources. And then as I went further along, I would see quotes taken out of context. Mm. I would see there's some pretty evident bias also coming from some of these authors in various ways. And again, to go back to John and George, one of the things that struck me the first time I read Shout, as well as Ray Coleman's work, is how very little just attention, let alone credit, is given to John and George, or excuse me, to George and Ringo, Mm -hmm. that for a considerable part of the book, they barely exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only now is it getting a little bit more balanced. And I think the band themselves realized that um, even when they did the anthology, 
that was that's basically a, kind of a Fab Four narrative as well to a degree. But they did balance it with George and Ringo certainly, and that was refreshing because in that case, some of the best stuff I think came from Ringo because we just never heard much from him. He's so far as I know, there's never been a, a biography written on him. There um, have been a few. Oh, I'm happened. trying to remember. I read one for my book. It methodologically had some issues. Mm -hmm. I don't think it delved too deeply into new research. And that's really one of the things that gives a book value is if the author has done new research and unearthed mm -hmm. previously inaccessible or unavailable primary sources. I don't recall mm -hmm. that from that particular book. But even just going back to what we were discussing with World War I and the soldiers, getting a perspective or going in depth on a perspective that had been marginalized or in some cases outright ignored, that adds a new mm -hmm. perspective, a level of nuance and important information that you may previously have been unaware of. Yeah. What I find interesting is that when people are made aware of new evidence, they will still cling, not everybody, but oftentimes will cling to an old narrative that has been um, refuted or new evidence goes against that. And, they, and what, their, what their response is, is that primary sources are stronger than secondary sources. In other words, it, it comes, if it came from the horse's mouth, that's where I want, that's where the more, more truth is, which is not always the case at all. And so I, I run into, into that on my channel all the time. And it's really frustrating because people just, you know, they want to believe a certain narrative, I guess, because they like a certain person. They don't like bad things said about their hero. I understand that. But it's really interesting how how violently they react sometimes to the new evidence and how they try to discredit it. And my answer for that would really be that's not what history teaches us. Mm -hmm. And now, having said that, you cannot ignore a primary source. Mm -hmm. But you also have to analyze it for credibility. And I'll give you a good example. I read an excellent book on the Galveston hurricane mm -hmm. of 1900. And for those of you who don't remember, the Galveston hurricane of September 8th, September 9th is the deadly single, oh, excuse me, single deadliest day in American history. Mm -hmm. Because what happened is that a hurricane that the Weather Bureau thought was going up the Atlantic seaboard actually hit Galveston, Texas. Now, the person in the in Galveston for the Weather Bureau, a man by the name of Isaac Klein, as the morning and afternoon of September 8th went on, started to realize that a weather catastrophe was coming, although he had no idea of the scope of it. Mm -hmm. Now, you will have the hurricane hit the evening and the night of the 8th, end of the ninth, anywhere from six to 12,000 people will die. Uh, the average, I believe that they use is 8,000. Mm. And Isaac survived the storm, although his pregnant wife died. Mm. And he would spend the rest of his life giving discussions and presentations about the hurricane. And he claimed at all of these presentations that as the afternoon went on the eighth, and he realized that something was coming, that he went to the beach in Galveston and just started warning everyone he saw to get off the beach, go to higher ground, go to the sturdiest buildings they could find, take mm. shelter. And that's what we have from Isaac Klein. And he is a primary source. And he said this multiple times. What we don't have is corroborating evidence mm. because even though we have the accounts of hundreds if not thousands of survivors of the Galveston hurricane, not one of them mentions being stopped by Isaac Klein and being told to go seek higher ground, to find a safer structure, mm. that a storm was coming. So you always have to analyze the evidence and look and see, is there corroborating evidence? What kind of corroborating evidence is it? And really we have a scale of types of evidence and how we judge how credible a piece of evidence is. Now, the thing about a primary source is that you cannot ignore it 
but just because it's a primary source absolutely does not mean that it's bulletproof. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we see that a little bit in the Beatles story as well, because these guys were under tremendous pressures and there was all kinds of other things acting against them that would give them uh, maybe a jaundiced view or certainly their own personal perspective. You know, they may want to not look like the villain or they've got an agenda as well. And it's not a bad thing. It's just a human thing. You know, I'll, I'll mention to people about, you know, the, the movie Rashomon or, you know, mm -hmm. you've got four people at a corner that sees, sees an ac accident. They're all primary sources, but the report of what they saw could be vastly different. So you have to have the other sources help to corroborate that or support, you know. So that's it, it takes it takes a lot of work <laughs> to get to closer to the truth. And um, not that you get absolute perfection truth, because that's probably unattainable. Right. Uh, but I think that obviously getting closer to the truth is something to strive for and being open to new evidence is a good thing. My goal with any anything I read on the Beatles, whether it's an old book or a new book or mm -hmm. an interview or anything is really, is this source going to get me closer to the most accurate version of Beatles history possible? That's a good way to look at it. And I, I didn't start looking at it, at it that way until after I, well, after I started reading Mark Lewison, but certainly then after I read your book, because I really, if, if there's something bad I found out about the Beatles, it doesn't really affect me. I mean, it's not like I <clears throat> have to hide that. I don't have a horse in the race, you know? So yeah, the closer, the better. Well, let's go into the Lewis and narrative a bit. If you could uh, give us a little bit of background on that and what his writings meant to the overall history. Well, one of the elements of the Lewis and narrative that, isn't so much a product of Lewison, but does help result in him is what we refer to as historical distance in that you have enough passage of time that people can start viewing things with greater objectivity, or you have previously unavailable primary sources that become available. And it's also really in the late 80s, early 90s, around the origin of the Lewis and narrative and the origin of the Lewis and narrative isn't quite as cut and dry as when the Lennon remembers narrative begins or when the shout narrative begins, those are very easily identifiable, but it's really in the late eighties and early nineties that you start to have a full fledged pushback by Paul McCartney arguing against the Lennon remembers narrative or the shout narrative, really both. And so Paul is giving extensive interviews, arguing that things happened this way, that the breakup was not his fault, or at least not solely his fault, talking about the songwriting between him and John. And all of those things provide more evidence, which again has to be assessed on its relative merits, that allow for not necessarily just a more impartial version of history, but to use a cliche, to step back and see the forest for the trees. You can take a, a longer view. Okay. And Paul gets, uh, because Paul took it upon himself to what's called revise some of the Beatles history, he gets to this day, he is called a revisionist. And to, to some people, they use the term revisionist as a pejorative and they use it as if what he's saying is he's being dishonest about the history to try to make himself look better and my understanding of revisionism i mean history is always some kind of in some form of revision i guess because so long as the information is accurate and truthful yes it's revisionist but doesn't mean it's wrong right so yeah, McCartney really, he's to this day, I think he's really, he's got a new book coming out now. I don't know if you heard about it, lyric, a lyric book. Yes. And I just, I haven't looked into this too much, but I, what I have already seen on YouTube anyway, is some pushback to his furthering their view of this bad revisionism. So, I mean, he's still kind of up against it, but, you know, but hopefully a guy like Lewison, who is, on the outside, 
can help bring a little bit of reasoning to that. And obviously, Paul, what Paul has given to us uh, in this revisionary, uh, the works he's done with, say, Barry Miles, a lot of that's been very positive and very good, I think. Yeah, you can't just sweep away any and all revisionism, mm -hmm. because as you mentioned, narratives absolutely change over time with numerous historical subjects. Now, what you have to do is, again, evaluate every source on their own respective merits. Paul cannot be ignored because he is a primary source. That's not to say that you blindly accept everything he says, mm -hmm. but you judge his statements according to historical methods, the same way you would judge John's or George's or Ringo's. And I would find it curious to, well, and errant, frankly, to just sweepingly dismiss certainly any primary source, but also secondary sources as well, mm. because they contribute to the historiographical arc as well. And the, the Lewison narrative or what Mark Lewison brought to the table, I thought was a lot of documentation, because that's basically what he bases all of his research on. It's pieces of paper. And there's some very interesting truths that those pieces of paper have told us that even the Beatles themselves didn't even know. Things like, I think the Beatles' original contract with EMI. And uh, that was that was incredibly eye-opening to me. But just goes to show how new evidence can, can pop up from a vault, from a library, from a diary, mm -hmm. and really add to the overall story. Well, and documentation is considered a superior source generally to eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. And different types of documents are also considered more credible than others. Mm. So a document that exists purely to create a record, such as a birth certificate or a wedding mm. certificate or a contract, mm. those are considered to be methodologically superior or credible to a newspaper editorial mm. written by the same individual. Because an editorial has a public element to it that a shopping list, for example, does not. Well, let's talk about uh, one of the examples from, uh, I think it was the Lewis, it's the Lewis and narrative. I think Mark Lewis and maybe did ferret this out, had to do with when John Lennon was born, he was born during a bombing raid in you know World War II. And that's something that uh, was in the Hunter Davies book. And he had interviewed a, for a primary source, which was John's Aunt Mimi. Mm -hmm. And she told that story. Well, it didn't take a very good historian to be able to figure out that the day he was born, that there was no bombing going on at all. And that was left just accepted for years until Lewison did a little bit of footwork and realized that that's not how it went. So I think that's, uh, there's uh, probably dozens, if not scores or hundreds of little things that Lewison has brought out of just little bits of evidence that just gives it more truth or gives it more credibility. Well, and other people have commented on that too. I think you have George Martin commenting, and it may be the introduction to the Complete Beatles recording sessions, mm. where he says something to the effect of mm. an enormous amount of complete rubbish has been accepted and repeated mm -hmm. without being checked. Mm -hmm. And you've had other authors, Mark Hertzgard mentions that as well, talks about some of the methodological issues mm -hmm. with certain authors in Beatles historiography. And certainly for me, Lewison's greatest strengths are his citations, mm -hmm. because I think it might be John Lewis Gaddis, and he's the author of The Landscape of History, which is one of the historiography books that I used as a reference in my book. And Gaddis says, you cannot trust a source that you cannot find and you can't find a source that an author doesn't provide you. So it's absolutely crucial that when you get any sort of book that argues that it does research that you can turn to the back and look and see this is where this quotation came from. This is when this interview was given. This is who mm -hmm. the interview was given to. This is the context mm 
the chronological context, personal context, and not being provided those things really means, number one, you're flying blind as a reader to an extent, but also you don't know what material the author is taking out or what they're leaving in, in terms of their selection of evidence. And that's also very frustrating. Mm -hmm. I think so many, for so many years, we've just come to accept these writers as almost like um, the gospel because they haven't provided that, or if they've provided it at all, they make it very difficult to check up on. Uh, but with the internet now, it's so much easier to to do that. I think that's also part of the reason why we're getting this this fourth narrative, the Lewison narrative. It makes it easier to to fact check some of this stuff. Whereas before, I mean, if you didn't have the books, I mean, it's really quite a quite a challenge to gather all that together. Even now, it's a challenge with the internet. But without it, Absolutely. it's really almost impossible. Well, so I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to say it's a challenge. It's also expensive. Yeah. If I had actually bought all of the books that I had to read for my own book, I would have spent thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, I was able to use the interlibrary loan system, so I didn't wind up buying anything. Yeah. But luckily enough, sorry, other Beatles authors, I didn't buy your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars if you wanted to compare and contrast mm -hmm. what norman says with what goldman says with what coleman says or what john says in lennon remembers that yeah. would take an enormous amount of research for just the reader let alone other authors yeah and i've just started to buy more books now and books are they're still fairly affordable and as people go to the tablet versions and some of the used books are easier to find now uh some are already out of print and getting big money Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to add to my library and continue to, you know, it, it just takes time. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing there's probably been a thousand books written on the Beatles, probably easily. And I believe there are over a thousand, not to go off too much on a tangent. And if you want to cut this, you can, mm -hmm. but there's something called World Cat, which is the world catalog of, at least in the English language, mm -hmm. what libraries hold on certain subjects. I worked mm -hmm. in a library in college. So that's why I'm familiar with this. Okay. And if you type in the subject, the Beatles, and then books, I believe you have over a thousand entries. Now, not all of them are English, although the vast majority of them are. Mm -hmm. But that's how I got a hold of almost all of the books that I used for my research is what's called interlibrary loan. I would request, okay. because I work for a university, I teach American history, I can request as many interlibrary loans as I like. Okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, that you needed to do that because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the amount of information in your book is, is quite staggering. So, but the thing I like about your book, though, and I've got it right here, it is, it's an easy read. It's not, how many pages? It's about 250 pages. It's not a, a huge Bible that is cumbersome. And uh, that's one of the great things about it. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. And I got through it quick and it got me, that's what got me buying a lot of other Beatle books because I wanted to see for myself the biases and the strengths of the books or things they omitted. And you know, when it's okay to have a little bit of opinion in there, so long as you know it's their opinion. Right. And some, sometimes that's extremely valuable too. It's just an interesting perspective. So that's um, what I try to do on this channel. And when I do offer an opinion, I try to let people know, hey, this is my opinion. So. Um, but yeah, I think, and I that's... think that's an excellent way to approach it. I don't have a problem at all with authors offering their opinions or making their arguments so mm -hmm. long as they designate this is my opinion or this is my assumption instead mm -hmm. of when you don't have citations in the text, it can be difficult to tell when an author is using primary source evidence or secondary source evidence, or when they are simply arguing their own perspective. Good point. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's end it right here. Uh, I want to bring you back and do two more topics. We're going to talk about John, the John versus Paul debate. And then the third one will be kind of a Beatles rogues gallery of authors. <laughs> so okay. uh, people can get your book in the links below. Uh, you can get it either purchase the hardcover book or the Kindle version of it. 
or you could try to get it on interlibrary loan. Oh, okay. Very good. And I don't actually get any money for that. So just keep that in mind that I'm suggesting this to you. I love libraries. Very good. All right. Well, thank you for that.